confusion about rain screens. Believe it or not, there isn't really a consensus on what rain screen means. Some people describe specific products as rain screens, and other people use the term more generically to refer to a wall design that incorporates drainage behind the cladding, but that might also do something or other with ventilation and pressure. It's confusing, and that makes it not a great term. I much prefer terms that convey specific functions, and that's what we're gonna do here instead. We're gonna talk about the design principles that people commonly reference when they use the term rain screen, but we're gonna use more specific terms. When someone says rain screen, they're usually describing the way a wall drains, the way a wall dries, the way a wall handles building pressures, or a combination of all three. Let's start with drainage. Most walls in North American residential and commercial construction are drained walls. Drained walls have a cladding that sheds water and a water control material and drainage space behind the cladding to protect the rest of the assembly. Windows, doors, and service penetrations are sealed to the water control membrane. The building code refers to this membrane as the water resistive barrier, WRB. This water management strategy permits us to build out of lightweight, moisture sensitive materials. The water control membrane, airspace, and cladding work together to protect the moisture sensitive materials behind them. The water control membrane protects the most moisture sensitive components of the wall, sheathing, framing, insulation, and drywall. The cladding sheds water, and the airspace between them provides one, a capillary break, two, drainage for liquid water that bypasses the cladding, and three, moisture removal by air exchange, drying. It's important to note that the cladding will dry into this airspace when it gets wet after a rain, but the interior parts of the wall will also dry into this space. The moisture sensitive parts of the wall behind the water control membrane get wet from small discontinuities in the water control membrane, from fasteners that hold the cladding in place, for example, minor construction defects, and from interior sources, such as people breathing, cooking, cleaning, etc. When we think of water management in drained walls, we tend to focus on the water control membrane. The building codes have long required the inclusion of a water control membrane, or water resistive barrier, in drained walls. But these membranes are never completely watertight and have always relied on drainage and ventilation to be effective. This is not because the membranes are defective, nor is it because they have been incorrectly installed. Water control membranes have just always been designed to be used as part of a system of water management, and that system requires both drainage and ventilation, drying, to be effective. Now, often, when people use the term rain screen, they're really just intending to emphasize the importance of the space between the WRB and the cladding, and communicating that this space ought to be created by the deliberate inclusion of some kind of material like furring strips or cladding clips or drainage mat. This is a reasonable thing to want to communicate. Drained walls are a system and the amount of drainage and ventilation that system requires is indeed relevant to us. Lapped vinyl siding, for example, doesn't require a whole lot of space between the water control membrane and the cladding to work. A brick veneer, which has the capacity to hold a lot of water, requires more space for drainage and drying though. And here we run up against the limitations of our terminology. Neither the term drained wall nor rain screen tells us how large that space between the cladding and the water control membrane ought to be. Here, it will help us to understand specifically what that space is really doing for us. We need it to do four things. One, provide a space for liquid water to drain, i.e. relieve hydrostatic pressure. Two, provide a capillary break between the cladding and the water control layer, i.e. a physical interruption to wicking water. Three, provide what's called hygric redistribution, basically a temporary safe storage space for water that evaporates into that space after wicking through the cladding or that diffuses through the cladding. And four, provide moisture removal by air exchange, i.e. drying from ventilation. Of these four factors, the first three really only require a very modest amount of space to be effective. 
And in fact, if the first three factors were the only ones at play, we'd only need a space of about 1 32nd of an inch or about one millimeter. That's it, even in wet climates. So why then does the building code require more space than that? The code tells us to include at least an inch space behind masonry claddings and a 3 16th inch space behind stucco claddings in wet climates. And that's just code minimum. I recommend exceeding code minimum and providing at least a quarter inch space behind stucco and adhered stone claddings to my clients who are building in wet climates. If we return to our list, the reason we might need a larger space behind our cladding is not because our walls require additional drainage, even in wet climates, but because they require additional drying. And they don't just universally require more drying, they require additional drying to compensate for other design decisions. But these other design decisions are complicated and there are infinite combinations at play. So we often just overshoot the mark a bit and provide more drawing than we really need just to be safe. The danger with that though, is that when we forget the why behind our decisions, we can introduce constraints into our designs that don't need to be there. And we can limit ourselves in unnecessary ways or spend more money than we need to. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Let's look more carefully at these other design decisions that make a larger space between the cladding and the WRB necessary. The first condition requiring a larger space for drawing is the use of a reservoir cladding and pairing that reservoir cladding with a water control membrane that is very vapor permeable. Reservoir claddings are claddings like brick, adhered stone, and stucco that hold a lot of water. And by very vapor permeable water control membrane, I mean one that's more than about 20 perms. What happens in this situation is we get excessive wetting when the sun comes out after a rain and drives water vapor into the rest of the wall assembly. This is called solar vapor drive and it can overwhelm the wall's capacity to store and redistribute water and we can get rot and mold and other moisture problems in our walls. Including a larger gap between the cladding and the water control membrane allows the wet reservoir cladding to dry into that space before it ever gets into the wall. We could also just not use such a vapor open water control membrane, but we may have another reason why we want our water control membrane to be so vapor open. A second condition that requires a larger space for drawing between the cladding and the water control membrane is the use of an interior vapor barrier. An interior vapor barrier, such as polyethylene sheeting, prevents interior drying. And we might really need interior drying to compensate for the same solar vapor drive we described before. Now, here again, we could just eliminate the interior vapor barrier, but we might need that interior vapor barrier for a different reason. For example, to keep interior moisture out of our wall assemblies in cold climates in the winter to avoid condensation problems within the wall. A third condition that requires a larger space for drawing between the cladding and the water control membrane is insufficient, or no, exterior insulation in a cold climate. In winter, our sheathing will be cold, and when warm, moisture-laden interior air reaches that surface, we'll get condensation. This happens even in mild climates, but in colder climates, that sheathing gets colder and stays colder for longer, meaning our sheathing gets wetter and stays wetter for longer. This is often fine if we allow that sheathing to dry to the exterior. And what helps it dry to the exterior? A vapor open water control membrane and a larger ventilation space behind the cladding. If that sheathing weren't so cold because we were using exterior insulation, we wouldn't need so much drying. A fourth condition that requires a larger space for drying between the cladding and the water control membrane is insufficient interior air and vapor control. This is related to the third condition we just discussed. In winter, our sheathing is cold. And if we're in a cold climate where that sheathing is really cold and stays that way for a long time, and we also don't have any interior air and vapor control membrane, more warm moisture laden interior air will reach the sheathing than otherwise would if we did have a well detailed interior air and vapor control membrane we'll get condensation on that sheathing and we'll need more exterior drying as a result. You'll note that apart from that first condition, the one about reservoir claddings and a two open WRB, the other conditions on this list tend to be more typical of cold climate design. 
And for this reason, it's not surprising that Canadians have much more familiarity with larger spaces behind their claddings, and they have stricter code requirements to that effect. But if we were to eliminate the reservoir cladding, the two open water control membrane, the interior vapor barrier, and if we were to add exterior insulation, or if we were building in a warmer climate, we really wouldn't need a whole lot of space for drainage and drying. Of course, designs frequently include all or some of these things, and it's often easier to just specify a larger space. Right now, we're seeing serious problems related to insufficient drying in the United States, mostly behind stucco and adhered stone cladding. So it's really not such a bad idea to overshoot the mark and provide a larger space for drainage and drying. And practically speaking, this means including a drainage mat behind these cladding systems. There's really no harm in overshooting the mark with other cladding systems either. And many of the mechanisms for inexpensively creating that space, such as furring strips, already provide more drying than we really need. Plus, not only is the extra drying good in that it gives us more flexibility in our material selection and more forgiveness in our installations, but the extra space also helps us accommodate framing tolerances. In my own professional practice, I recommend drainage mat or furring strips on every custom home. But overshooting the mark isn't always good. We can run into a problem when we wish to include exterior insulation. When we use exterior insulation, many of our reasons for requiring extra drying behind the cladding go away. And here we start to see a real incentive for not overshooting the drying mark. Adding more of a space than we need can come at both a thermal and a financial cost. When using exterior insulation, I recommend using a drainable insulation like mineral wool and including a small gap in front of the exterior insulation to accommodate framing tolerances. Usually a quarter inch or so will be fine, but it depends on the cladding. If the exterior insulation is non-draining, like foil-faced polyisocyanurate, for example, I recommend including a textured building wrap behind the insulation for drainage, plus that same quarter inch or so gap in front of the insulation for the, for the framing tolerances. Those textured building wraps provide about 1 32nd of an inch for drainage, which is all we really need. And keeping that space small means that we preserve the thermal performance of the insulation. We do reduce it a bit, but only a little bit. One last thing before concluding. We started this conversation about the term rain screens, and I realize I've left something out, pressure. A lot of people think that one of the advantages of having this gap between the cladding and the rest of the wall is that it provides pressure equalization. The logic is that the wind will pressurize that space and basically fill it up so that the pressure in the cavity behind the cladding is the same as the pressure on the exterior of the cladding and that this will counter the effect of wind-driven rain. The thing is, it doesn't quite work that way. The pressure equalization effect has been demonstrated to work in small building joints, but not in large spaces behind whole cladding systems across entire elevations. What we end up with is not pressure equalization, but pressure moderation at best. Manufacturers and consultants really love the term pressure equalized rain screen though, and admittedly it sounds really cool. But while it's probably not worth an argument, it's not like it changes our assemblies or our detailing either way, I figured I ought to mention it.